Hello. Welcome to Older and Loving It, a program designed to address the legal and life planning concerns of seniors and their families. My name is Philip Summers. I'm an elder law and estate planning attorney with Summers, Summers & Associates, located in Acton, Massachusetts. In the wake of recent economic changes, having a sound financial plan to navigate your way through the aging process is becoming increasingly necessary. Seniors often face a myriad of issues and concerns that are reflected in differing financial needs and goals. Although investing is just a small part of senior financial planning, it is a component that you should be educated about. One of the main principles of investing at any age is to invest your money based upon your timeline and specific goals. As we get older, our financial goals and tolerance for risk often changes. What was appropriate at a young age, such as wealth accumulation, may be vastly different in our golden years where our financial goal may be wealth preservation. So how do you go about planning your financial future if you are a senior? We are fortunate today to have Janine Olson, a financial advisor located in Waltham, Massachusetts, and who is an expert in financial planning. Janine has been a financial advisor with Morgan Stanley since 2008 and has been in the financial services industry for the past 17 years. Her experience includes 10 years at Fidelity Investment and two years at Morningstar Investment. Janine works with many seniors and focus her practice on helping individual investors create and adhere to financial plans that meet their personal financial needs. Janine lives in Concord, Massachusetts with her husband and five children. Janine, welcome to the show. Thank you. Janine, the last several years have been, I guess we can be gentle and say, it's been very challenging. There's been a wild ride on Wall Street. Many seniors have lost quite a bit of their net worth. What are some of the issues that you see in your practice, uh, some of the challenges that seniors are facing these days when they're looking at their financial plans? Well, aside from just the market volatility that we've seen in the last um, several years, I think that some of the things specific to seniors um, that we really need to be concerned about are inflation. Um, we need to think about increased life expectancy. We need to think about the changing um, retirement income streams that people might have or might have depended on in the past that are changing. Um, and also need to think about the various sources of income that are going to supplement um, those things like pension plans that are no longer around or Social Security where the, the um, benefit may be limited. Sure, now you, you, you've given us a lot of good information there. So I thought, why don't we drill down to each one a little bit more uh, succinctly and you know, a little more, uh, you know, a little more, uh, I guess, precision. Let's talk about inflation. Now, inflation hasn't been a worry uh, recently, mm -hmm. but people who've lived through the 70s and before that when we've had uh, uh, you know, substantial inflation can understand what happens when you're on a fixed income you have high inflationary times. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what's the impact of inflation. Sure. You know, inflation, as you mentioned, in the last year or two hasn't really been much of an issue because of what's been going on with the market. Um, but I think overall and over time, inflation's averaged about 3% a year. But if you take a look at some examples of just standard things that you might purchase, like postage stamps, you know, and back in 1980, a postage stamp for a letter was 15 cents, and in 2010, it was 44 cents. Mm. So really, that equates to about 193% inflation over the course of that time. So what we need to be concerned about is inflation erodes borrowing and purchasing, or excuse me, purchasing power. And really, in order to preserve the purchasing power that someone has today, they need to have their money grow so that over time and in their retirement when they're not actively generating income, their money can really buy what it can today as they age and sure. as they need the money. Yeah, and just look at the uh, you know, gas prices for one, I mean, how dramatically they have risen. Also food prices, look at mm -hmm. corn and some other basic staples. I mean, they have dramatic increases over the, you know, over the past uh, year. So when you're investing, how do you consider inflation? I mean, is there certain investment vehicles that you can you look to that will give you, I guess, a hedge against inf inflation? There are, and there's a couple slides later on in the presentation as we go through that will um, that will display some of those things. But some of the hedges against inflation can be investing in stocks because the stock market has typically risen in periods of rising inflation. Um, so those are so commodities are also another inflationary hedge. Um, mm -hmm. So investing in general tends to be an inflationary hedge. Okay. Um, and it's just a matter of what those investments um, are diversified into. And as long as the portfolio itself is a diversified portfolio and includes some of those things, um, again, it should be age appropriate. But age certainly appropriate. those are some of the things that you need to be thinking about. To, sure, and to we say age hedge. appropriate. What was important when you're younger 
when you first got out of college certainly changes as you right. get towards the golden years. Right. Now, one of the other things you mentioned was longevity. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, people are, I guess, the good news is people are living longer. Sure. You know, certainly it's been a, a, certainly a change in that. But I guess, you know, when people are retiring, they're having a longer retirement period. So if, I wonder if you can talk about a little bit about the impact of, uh, you know, people living longer sure. and how that has affected. So as of right now, I think the average age is 77. Um, it, for an American, um, and uh, in 2050, that average age will be about 82, um, mm. and that's the average. So people are living longer, and that's great news. But as people live longer, they're spending more years in retirement, and so their funds need to last longer. So in some cases, people will actually be retired longer than they will be actively in earning an income. So you really need to make sure that that's part of your plan and that you've planned for longevity. And some of the ways that you can do that is by thinking about your own history and how your family has, you know, over the time, over over time, how they've aged and and what the um, the life expectancy sure. has been for your own personal situation. And all that's not a although that's not a guarantee. It certainly gives you something to work with as far as what yeah. your expectations and your assumptions can be built around. So I think that's important. Yeah. It also seems people who are, are during the retirement years. They're much more active. They're doing things. They're traveling. They're volunteering. So it's not where you know you worked for one company, you got the golden watch, and then you you know you you, you took it easy. Right. Now you know the seniors want to do things, and and I, I imagine this has a, an impact on your financial planning. Absolutely, and I think that that's one of the things that makes it very important to have a conversation about what your plans are in retirement, because depending on what you're planning on doing your income needs can be very different. So typically, um, from a planning point of view, you want to plan to have 70 to 80% of your income in retirement that and, you were getting in your working years. If I can just mention, you know, why do you say 70 to 80%? Because because I, I've, I've heard that term used before, you know, because that seems like a big cut from what you're used to. But your expenses are also significantly lower. So if you figure your gas expenses are lower, your travel expenses are lower, your entertaining expenses are typically lower. So in general, again, depending on what you're going to be doing in retirement, okay, your sure. expenses would be lower. If, however, you have sort of extravagant plans for retirement, that may be different. And so it is important to think about and to talk about what those plans will be so that the financial plan can incorporate what you're really planning on doing and okay. be more accurate. So the average and the sort of the sort of baseline is to talk about 70 to 80 yeah, okay. percent. That makes sense. But again, you, you really need to adjust that based sure. on what your own plans Absolutely. are. Absolutely, and also what your, what, your, what your goals are during your retirement. Mm -hmm. Now, you also mentioned, I think, briefly about the defined benefit plans. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, I think people were used to getting pensions in the sure. past, and that's certainly not the case any longer. Right. I think we have different sources of income for. Right. So, uh, what is going on, and you know, what, is there things that we should be uh, thinking about in that area? Sure. A lot of companies have done away with pension plans because it does, they do come with very stringent rules and regulations and there's certainly a financial commitment by the company to fund and also continue to monitor pension plans. So a lot of companies have decided just to, not, to simply not offer them anymore and get out from under that obligation. And so what's taken place is defined contribution plans, which are 401k plans, okay. where the individual actually contributes for their own benefit. Um, and so it's important to make sure that you're understanding what that contribution should be, what that benefit to you at the end is going to be once those investments uh, grow. Um, but it means that there's not a secure, guaranteed income payment mm -hmm. stream like there would have been with a defined contribution or a pension plan. Um, I think we have a statistic that um, in 1985, the number of pension plans um, had declined from 114,000 to less than 29,000 between 1985 and today. Um, that is a dramatic so, change in just such a short, short period of time. It's a huge shift, yeah. and I think it's a recognition of these companies that they really can't deal with the burden of those pension plans, but it really does shift the burden from those corporations onto the individuals to really save for their own retirement. So it sounds like, you know, previously we had a defined pension plan, we had a fixed amount. There wasn't, I guess, not as much worry because you always had to worry if the company was still staying in business, but now I guess the onus is on the employee because now they really have to, I guess, take close oversight of their own yes. investing in their own funds. Exactly. So you knew in the past that your pension was going to last for your lifetime and that you didn't really need to worry about income and you knew what that income was going to be before you started taking it. And now that's not the case anymore and you really need to to try to understand what your goals are going to mean that you'll need and then how long you'll need it. So there's a lot of sort of complicated 
um, many more factors, yeah. And many yeah. more factors, I guess, that sort of affects the whole, whole plan. I guess that's why it's important to get a, you know, a financial advisor to help you through this. Now, Jeanine, in terms of Social Security, Medicare, I mean, those are always, you know, one of the legs of the stool we sure. could always count on, uh, you know, to help seniors in, the, in, these, in, in these years. And I guess as you read the papers and if you watch what's going on in Washington, there's always the concern. How should seniors react to this? I think that if you're in retirement now, the, the general consensus is that the benefits aren't going to change. So if you're already collecting Social Security, likely none of your benefits will change. If you haven't started collecting yet, um, for instance, um, people born in the year of 1954, instead of starting to be able to collect at age 65, they won't be able to collect until mm -hmm. age 66. So there may be changes to when we can collect Social Security. There may be changes to the amount that we'll be able to collect. Sure. Um, and so that's something that we certainly need to keep in mind from a planning point of view. And even if you are collecting Social Security now and you have a sense of what that benefit is, is now and will be in the future, there's also the risk of Medicaid and um, the benefits there changing or sure. potentially going away or whatever the case may be. I don't know um, what the future will bring yeah. as far as that, but certainly health care costs are going up. And yeah, I, um, I think we can almost, you know, with some certainty say the, the, the benefit amount will not increase. I mean, it certainly is, is, is it, everything we hear is going to be either you'll have to wait longer to collect yes. the, maybe the amount. There's also a funding issue mm -hmm. of uh, Social Security that could put the program at risk. And we, we don't want to alarm seniors, but, you know, I think these are considerations you need to think about yes. as your sources of income. And they're all things that certainly the government is talking through and we're trying to figure out as a nation as far as what we'll do with this. But I think it's, it's fair to say that changes will happen. It's just a matter of what those changes look like. And again, that needs to be part of the planning process to assume that, you know, from a conservative point of view, that the Social Security payment that you receive is probably not going to be enough for you to live off of um, mm -hmm. unless you're living very modestly. Um, so it, again, it's it's a consideration. It's a it's an income benefit as we know it today. Yeah. But it's certainly not enough for people to survive right. on in most cases. So that makes you know planning so particularly important here because that's just one piece of the puzzle. Right. Is what's we, now we look at some uh, sources of income. Is there other areas that uh, we should be focused on, or should we look, review, take a look at? Well, there are other sources of income. So I think when you're doing a financial plan and a retirement plan, what you really need to think about is what sources of income are applicable to you. Um, so first, it, you know, is there a pension plan that is there for your family? Because in some cases, firms do still have them. So some people still do have the ability to, um, to plan on some pension benefit. It may not be as high as it used to be because of the longevity that that person was at that particular firm. But for some people, it is there. So um, think about whether or not there's a pension benefit that would be a source of income in retirement. How much Social Security is going to be? So typically, you receive your Social Security benefit um, pamphlet in the mail from the Social Security Administration. So you can get a sense of what that payment will be in retirement. Um, there are um, savings and other investments. So we talked about 401k plans. And so to get a better understanding as you're doing your plan about how much you have in savings now, whether it's in a retirement account or otherwise, and how much of that you might be able to tap into as you need income in retirement. Okay. Um, there's also whether or not there's an inheritance um, or a trust that's yeah, there um, for income in retirement, and whether that's being tapped into actively before retirement or not, how that plays into the income situation. Um, and then if there's any rental income, from properties mm -hmm. or whatnot. So I think thinking about all of that and trying to figure out how much of that is going to stay the same in retirement and how much of that is going to change Maybe helps affected, also sure. figure out that, that overall okay. picture. Many moving parts to the, to the yes. puzzle, as we <laughs> like to say. Now, as you look at, you know, what do you, I guess, quantify with the, in the, with the income pieces are? There's a number of considerations as you develop your plan mm -hmm. uh, that you, when you work with your clients. What are some of the considerations that you look at, uh, Jeannie? Like, I know you mentioned earlier how long people are going to work until they retire. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's a big factor. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we talk a little bit about that and some of the other factors that will certainly affect how you put together a financial plan. Sure. So some of those things are when you're going to retire, and then as you sort of take a or ideally when you want to retire, and then looking at those different factors as far as income and whatnot, really circling back and thinking, okay, is that realistic? Is it realistic for me to think about retiring at age 65 or at age 70? Or do I need to work a little bit longer? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to need to work part-time in retirement? And is that going to be OK? Um, and as you start to answer some of those questions, you can also start to figure out, was I a little bit too grandiose in my, grandiose rather, in my plan for retirement? And do I need to scale that back a little bit? Um, 
and um, you know how long your money is going to need to last. Again, we talked about the longevity issue, but to the extent that you have a sense of what your medical history looks like personally and what the history of your family has been, getting a sense of yeah. you know, do you think you'll live to 100 or or maybe is are you closer to the average? And sure. um, so <laughs> I think those things are really important to consider too. And when you have that conversation and when you have those some of the answers to those questions it, it helps you get a much clearer picture about what your money mm -hmm. what, how much you need to have and what that money is going to need to do and how you invest it um, now how about for uh, now the planning is, is very important because you know if you don't plan you know that can certainly cause problems but there's always unforeseen events mm -hmm. unforeseen problems can you plan for that is that can you help minimize I guess uh, if it's a medical you know trauma or a catastrophe can you plan something like that in the future? Well, what you can do is you can plan conservatively for what you think your needs will be, and certainly think about things like a catastrophe and making sure that you have estate planning documents in place, for instance, or thinking about a death in the family of somebody that may be a primary wage earner. So thinking about making sure that you have the right insurance that's in place, um, thinking about long-term care insurance when the time comes. Typically, people start to think about that in their 50s, so that um, it's you know at that point um, it probably makes the most financial sense to think about um, long-term care insurance if okay. that's appropriate for the situation. But sort of planning for reasonably planning for catastrophes, you can't foresee okay. everything, but at least you can sort of get the things in place that you would need to in the event that that happens to mitigate some of the impact. Okay. Um, because certainly if, if there's a death of a, a breadwinner, there's the, yeah. the emotional impact, but you want to at least deal with the financial impact sure as much you, as you can. Absolutely. Now, does, does, does a person's investment objectives change when they're in their 60s, perhaps 70s, 80s, even older? Does it change in terms of what, what you would recommend for a mix or what the plan would be? Typically, yes. Um, it, so as you get closer to needing the money, you get more conservative. So the idea is when someone's in their 20s or 30s or 40s even, if that pool of money is really meant to be used for retirement, you can be, assuming that your, your risk tolerance is there, you can be more aggressive. Yeah. And as you get closer to needing the money, what you're starting to do is you're starting to get into that phase of really wealth preservation and not necessarily growth. Mm -hmm. So in the earlier years, you're trying to accumulate your assets, you're trying to grow your assets, and then as you get older, you're really trying to just stabilize and maintain what you have sure. so that you don't lose anything. And um, I imagine when you're younger, you have a, a longer runway. So if you do yes. have a blip like we've had the last couple of years, exactly. you have a longer span of decades to overcome it. Whereas yes. now, there's many seniors that were, quite frankly, uh, devastated through this yes. economic uh, crisis. Yes. Right. And I think you do need to think about time frame. And when, you, you know, when you're within 10 years of, of needing to tap into those assets, you really need to start thinking about getting more conservative, even if in your 20s and 30s you were very aggressive. Um, I would say the one exception to that rule would be if you have a lot in the way of assets and you're looking to pass those on to a future generation. In that case, you may be 60 years old, but your pool of money is going to be passed on to your children or your grandchildren. And in that case, the time horizon for that money may be still 20 or 30 years, even though for you, what you need, you know, the portion that you need of that money is smaller. Sure. Now, you mentioned earlier about, you know, protecting against inflation. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the mix that you may want to consider, sure. uh, you know, in terms of maybe it's uh, fixed income, uh, maybe there's a stock portion, maybe bond, maybe there's yep. securities. I mean, there's a number of different, I guess, tools you can utilize. How do you approach that, Janine, with your clients? I think the, the most important thing is to have a diversified portfolio. And mm -hmm. the diversified portfolio should really be based on the level of risk that that person is comfortable with taking and also with the time horizon of the investments. So I think what you really want to think about is um, basing the investments on what you're comfortable with and with that particular time horizon. Some of the specific things that would be incorporated typically in a traditional portfolio would be stocks. Um, they tend to be an inflationary hedge because they're moving with inflation. So usually stocks rise in a rising inflationary Inflation, environment. Okay. Um, fixed income that's a little bit less um, of an inflationary hedge. Typically when interest rates rise, bond values go down. Sure. Um, so, but bonds are a very important part of people's portfolio and there are different types of bonds, lots of different types of bonds that react differently and offer different uh, rates of return and, um, mm -hmm. and interest rates as well. So, um, so I think it's really important to have a mix of those things in a portfolio. But the other thing that um, I think is becoming more commonplace to see inside portfolios 
is alternative investments that would include investments in commodities or companies that invest in commodities. And those tend to also be a hedge against inflation because commodities prices um, rise in a rising Well, we certainly know, lately, you know the certain commodities have increased in the last so, so yeah. years. Now, I, one of the important thing you mentioned is you're really balancing risk with, I guess, uh, return. I mm -hmm. guess that's always, uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure if conflict is the right word, but it's, it's always a balancing act. How do you manage that when you, when you look at that? Typically, um, again, it's, it gets back to the, the individual and how much time they have and how much um, they're comfortable with taking on risk. Because in general, the more risk you take, the more potential return you're opening yourself up for. But you're also opening yourself up for more volatility and more potential loss. Mm -hmm. So you have to really be aware of what the risks are in any investment that you right. choose to participate in. So it's in. okay to have a portion of your assets and, you know, risk, but you have to, I guess it'd be well known what that risk you know, is, first of all, also what your risk tolerance is when right. you're investing. Right, and also making sure that you're diversified, because it's one thing to say that you're investing in stocks when there's multiple stocks, or you're buying a mutual fund or an exchange-traded fund, where you have more than ownership in more than one particular entity. But to have a portfolio where you own stocks, but that representation is only one individual stock, yeah. that in and of That's itself risky. is risky. That's very risky. Um, so, yeah, so to think about risk, broadly in relation to w how your mix is allocated between stocks and bonds and commodities, um, and also to think about what your specific investment risk is in relation to what you're buying. All of yeah. those things are really important so it's almost when like you think a pyramid. about a plan. It's almost like a pyramid. You know, I think that's yes. how you described it exactly. uh, to me earlier. Exactly. In terms of investing is how you'd view the, your various investments. Yes. Okay. Now, we do have a, a couple scenarios that uh, 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 Ms. Olson was uh, nice enough to present to us, and I want to present some facts to you of, uh, we actually have three scenarios of different uh, couples and different individuals and different stages of, of their life. The first scenario is a married couple ages 55 and 56. They have two children, two grandchildren. Their current income is $150,000 a year. Their retirement goal is to do, do that in 10 years from now. Estimated Social Security income is $50,000 and the current savings is a million dollars. So this is a couple that's it has done very well and now uh, they're looking towards the golden years. Their concerns are really longevity and mm -hmm. obviously we can't predict how long we're gonna live, but uh, also retirement income replacement because when they do require, uh, retire, they are gonna have a, a drop in their current level income and also increased savings because yep. they still have 10 years before they retire. Right. Any suggestions you could give to this, this couple? First of all, I would say, as we had mentioned earlier, to really talk to an advisor. I think right. an advisor can help look at the tangible things like, what are you making now? What do you expect to receive in your retirement years? What do you have in the way of savings? But they can also talk through the intangibles, like what are you planning on doing when you retire? How much do you think you might need based on what you're doing and help talk through that process and mm -hmm. help them put a number on that? Um, and they can also help with next steps. So, for instance, does this couple have an estate plan? Should they be talking to an estate planning attorney sure. to get those documents in place? So it's not just financial, it's what goes all around it right. as well to ensure maybe insurance as well. Do exactly. they have the proper like, levels right. of insurance? And like we were saying earlier, you know, with, based on their ages, have they thought about long-term care insurance already? And if not, should they be thinking about that okay. to protect some of their assets um, from health care costs in the retirement years? The other thing that jumps out at me with this particular couple is it does look like there's a pretty big discrepancy between what they're making now and what they're expecting to make yeah. in retirement income. So one of the things that they might want to think about doing is increasing their savings now so that the pool of assets that they have is growing and the pool that they have to tap into in retirement so to receive some pool income. To draw upon it. Right. Okay, that's to a, that's supplement a, that income. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Now we also have a uh, second scenario. Uh, in this scenario, we have a married couple, ages 70 and 65, much closer to retirement. Mm -hmm. They have four children and seven grandchildren. Their current uh, income, and we're talking uh, pensions and Social Security income, is $100,000. Now their savings in, uh, and their net worth is in the $500,000 area. And now what their goals are is, first of all, uh, you know, there's a concern about health care costs. I think mm -hmm. it's a concern of many seniors, mm -hmm. um, you know, because that could also be devastating, but also inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, and inflation can come back and really devastate a portfolio. Mm -hmm. This married couple here, do you have any guidance for them? I think for this couple, it looks like they've got some guaranteed income, which is pretty significant. So that guaranteed income will be for their lifetime, and therefore they really have a cushion that they sure. they can fall back on. But because that guaranteed income is a defined 
amount, that's not going to change and it's not going to adjust so with inflation. So that's why inflation is such a big concern. This it is, a, exactly. It is a concern. So what they need to really be thinking about is how to invest that $500,000 so that it can potentially augment income if they need to sure. and really be there for them in the event that health care costs do rise or that there's some unpredicted event that happens that needs um, needs a significant cash flow. Sure. Um, so I think that it would be really taking th those funds and investing them in a prudent way so that it's um, growing for them and there for them in case they need it. Um, one thing that I might, um, that they may be thinking about that I think that they probably um, might want to actually avoid is an annuity. I know a lot of times seniors think about annuities as a, as a plan for, for um, guaranteed income for life. Um, but annuities really are meant to help someone that is at the risk of outliving their assets sure. pay and get payments for life. These people already have an annuity, essentially. Yeah. They have a pension and a Social yeah. Security income. The fixed income, income is, you know, that's, that's not going to change. Right. So they're, they're already fixed into that amount. Right. Okay. So I would say that it's really just taking that 500000 and putting yeah. in a diversified portfolio. And again, this is uh, speaking with a financial planner and you know, really understanding your goals first right. and then crafting this plan based on, uh, right. first of all, what their history is and what their, you know, uh, I guess, their, the, the station in life is. Right. Um, and that's um, good advice there. Now, the last scenario we have is, is a widow, age 80, she's a little bit older, has three children, nine grandchildren. But the, the facts are a little, uh, somewhat different here. Uh, in terms of current income, and we're talking pensions, investment, and Social Security is $100,000. But also, she has a fairly substantial uh, net worth of uh, close to $3 million. Uh, and this is based on a lifetime of savings. Mm -hmm. Now, the concern here is a little bit different. Before, we're talking about inflation, longevity, medical costs. This one's a little bit different. So, she has substantial assets, but now it's creating a legacy to be mm -hmm. able to pass on, I guess, the, the, the bonding of her fruit, you know, mm -hmm. what she's worked through uh, her life. And, uh, perhaps a spouse. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions here how you approach this one? Sure. Um, in this particular case, it appears again that she has plenty of income um, and that she's got certainly a, a, a vast amount of uh, net worth that she can then think about passing on to her heirs. And assuming that what she's wanting to do is to pass that on to her children, and I'm sort of making an assumption there because she may want to yeah. give it to charity. Yeah, it's also a consideration um, you can you know, certainly give it to charities right. and worthwhile organizations. Right, and again, it sort of warrants that conversation with an advisor to really cull out those, those details. But let's make the assumption here that she wants to pass this on to her grandchildren. Then some of the things that she wants to think about is how to invest that money for their lifetime and how to keep a portion of that intact so that to the extent that her investments are generating some income for her, she doesn't change that. But if there's a portion of that, those funds that she's already sort of allocated to her grandchildren, mm. then those funds can really be invested for them. And, and so talking to an advisor about what the appropriate mix would be for their lifetime makes a lot of sense. And, and how does the um, financial planner, because you know, we've had three different scenarios, and each one's different, mm -hmm. different goals and objectives. What's the value of working with someone like yourself, a financial planner? Well, I think that, especially in this case, some of the things that she could be talking about with a financial planner are, if I'm planning on investing this portion of my money for my grandchildren, and for instance, if some of that is in a retirement account, then she could think about some tax-efficient strategies like converting those assets into a Roth IRA. Mm. It would mean a tax hit today, but it would mean that there would be tax-free income over the next two generations for her grandchildren. Um, which would likely turn out uh, to be significant um, in the way of tax savings over their lifetime. Um, so it's things like that that can be, um, can be called out through the conversation, but that can also be run in the way of scenarios to really explore, here's all, scenario A, here's scenario right. B, what makes the most sense, and therefore what's right. the best decision for us based yeah. on the, it's the really situation. really bringing someone who's really knowledgeable and educated in this area and we're looking for the bench interests of the senior. Janine, thank you very much for your time. Uh, You're uh, welcome. You've been very informative, very helpful to our seniors. If someone wants to get a hold of you or has any questions, what's the best way to contact you? The best way to contact me is at the office. Um, my phone number and contact information um, will be made available, but um, my, sure. I, my phone number at the office is 781-672-5275. And otherwise, the best way to find me on the web is just to Google Janine Olson, <laughs> um, financial advisor, and right. it should come up. So, Janine, thank you very much. And that uh, brings a close to Older and Loving It. I want to, first of all, take, uh, thank our staff, our production crew, Monique Patterson on graphics, Connor Summers, the cameraman. Uh, and our director was Jordan O'Connor Katz, uh, who participated today, and as well as Ron Zerman. Again, my name is Philip Summers, and thank you for joining Older and Loving It.